In previous episodes in our mini-series on settlements, we've spoken about how they began, the Jewish connection to the West Bank, and the motivations behind the settlement movement. But today, we're gonna explore things from a different angle, the Palestinian experience. It's worth noting that I myself am not Palestinian, and I don't claim to speak for Palestinians here or try to tell someone else's story for them. But in the interest of exploring all sides of history, we're going to use facts compiled by various organizations and experts, as well as accounts from Palestinians themselves, in order to paint a picture of what that experience is like. Much of the difficulty surrounds the infamous O word. To some, including many Palestinians, the settlements are synonymous with occupation. To others, including many Israelis, they're nothing of the sort. And understanding the Israeli presence in the West Bank is a crucial step towards understanding the Palestinian perspectives over the last 50 plus years, as well as today. By the end of Israel's War of Independence, the borders of Israel included the coastal areas and some desert, while Jordan held the West Bank and Egypt held Gaza. Any Jewish communities in the Arab held areas were more or less destroyed. Then in the Six Day War of 1967, Israel gained all that land and more. While Israel offered to exchange some of the newly conquered land for peace, the Arab states ruled out any negotiations. Israelis began to settle and create communities in the new territories, including the West Bank, Gaza, and Sinai. Settlers and their supporters were motivated by various combinations of idealism, religion, and security concerns. In the West Bank, especially in those early years, Israelis who moved into the territory saw themselves as returning to their people's ancient homeland, founding many communities in the same areas where the Bible speaks of Jewish cities long ago. But to Palestinians, the settlements were a continuation of the invasion of the Six Day War, a slower invasion that they would eventually dub the occupation. Now, this word occupation is filled with both legal and emotional baggage. While the word originates from the Fourth Geneva Convention, legal scholars and political advocates have spent more than 50 years arguing over whether or not it really applies to Israeli control of the territory captured in the Six Day War, and whether or not that occupation is legal or illegal. Many Israelis reject the term occupation both because they affirm their historic rights to the land and because they believe that the Geneva Convention was about the Nazi occupation, a true foreign invasion, rather than a land dispute between warring peoples or neighbors. But to many Palestinians, the Jews have no rights to the land. They entered forcibly and transferred civilians. Since this episode is about the Palestinian perspective, we're going to use this word occupation moving forward, since whatever the legalities, it is a word that reflects many Palestinians' experiences. Still, even among Palestinians, the word occupation has many different meanings. As we've said, for some Palestinians, the occupation refers to the territory Israel captured in 1967. Other Palestinians argue that the Israeli occupation began in 1948 with the establishment of the Jewish state. They view the entire state of Israel to be an illegitimate colonial project, and they deny the historic connection of Jews to the land. And for many Palestinians, the term goes beyond just borders, referring to any aspect of Israeli military or civil control over Palestinian life. In the 1950s, Palestinian refugees who had lost their land in 1948 began fighting the occupation. They were called Palestinian Fedayeen, or those who sacrificed themselves, and were considered freedom fighters among Arabs. Israelis, on the other hand, considered them terrorists because of the hundreds of Israelis killed in Fedayeen attacks in the 1950s. After the Six Day War, also called the June War, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza faced many frustrations, but also some unexpected gains. American political commentator Thomas Friedman called this period the golden occupation, with increased literacy, the establishment of universities, and a growing economy. With the removal of the borders, Palestinians suddenly had significant freedom of movement both between the West Bank and Gaza, as well as within Israel proper. Not surprisingly, this newfound freedom under Israel resulted in the Palestinian economy growing significantly. This growth was supported by economic development plans initiated by Israel and Israel's reversal of Jordan's discriminatory policy against Palestinians forbidding extensive industry in Palestinian areas. Palestinians now had access to Israeli subsidies, credit, technical assistance, and trade with Israeli and overseas markets, things they had been denied under Jordanian occupation. Between 1967 and 1973, per capita income in the West Bank rose by 80%, and unemployment went down from 17% in 1968 to an unprecedented 0.4% in 1975. Yet many Palestinians still felt the weight of military rule. They could not govern themselves. Newfound feelings of nationalism and a desire for political independence couldn't just be dismissed by economic gains. The Palestinians were totally economically dependent on Israel. Sure, Palestinian employment was high and they earned more than ever before, 
but many were frustrated that they were paid less than Israeli workers and were seemingly taxed higher. And due to the historic lack of higher education, most Palestinians found themselves in more menial jobs with fewer benefits. Their frustration was exacerbated by their unhappiness with new Israeli settlements. During this period, Palestinian Fedayeen continued to attack Israelis inside and outside the West Bank and Gaza. Israel continued its campaign against the Fedayeen, arresting terrorists and political activists. As frustration with the Israeli presence and military activity grew, so did the violence. In December 1987, Palestinian anger exploded into a popular uprising now known as the First Intifada. Across the West Bank and Gaza, there was a combination of civil disobedience, violence against the Israeli military, and terror attacks against Israeli civilians. The Palestinians' outrage was channeled into general strikes, boycotting jobs, violent confrontations with Israeli soldiers, and a wave of rock and Molotov cocktail attacks on Israeli civilians and soldiers alike. Israel responded with military force and the introduction of checkpoints that limited Palestinian freedom of movement. Palestinians were now required to apply for permits to move between Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. The Israeli military said these checkpoints were necessary for fighting terrorists, but many Palestinians complained about checkpoints choking travel between certain areas, and some complained about harassment. While Israelis hoped these restrictions on freedom of movement would quell the violence, they also served to further outrage many Palestinians. The First Intifada finally ended in 1993 when Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and PLO leader Yasser Arafat signed the Oslo Accords. Over the next seven years, the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority engaged in intense negotiations, always under the shadow of violence on the ground. Despite this, Israel continued to remove its civil and military presence from Palestinian cities, handing autonomous control for these areas to the Palestinian Authority. This was a dramatic change for Palestinians who now had their own official and recognized governing body with control over their educational system, civil infrastructure, and police force. For the first time ever, the vast majority of Palestinians were living in near autonomy. In the year 2000, the US brought Israeli and Palestinian leadership together for final negotiations. Hopes were high that the sides would reach a final agreement that would at last create a Palestinian state. But those hopes were dashed when the Palestinian delegation rejected the US-Israeli proposal and walked out of the negotiations. Over the coming months, a new wave of violence and terror began to grow, eventually coming to be called the Second Intifada, or Al-Aqsa Intifada, after the mosque that sits on the corner of the Temple Mount. By the end of 2005, over 1,000 Israeli civilians and soldiers were killed, while over 3,000 Palestinian militants and civilians were killed as a result of the Israeli military operations and Palestinian infighting. Among the most significant results of the Second Intifada was Israel's construction of a barrier separating the West Bank from Israel. Now, this barrier is mostly comprised of fences with a few areas using high concrete walls. The Israeli government says it built the wall for security reasons and construction of the barrier was followed by a dramatic drop in terrorist attacks. But many Palestinians claimed that the barrier was intended as a land grab. Some referred to it as an apartheid wall, claiming it was created to enforce racial segregation, an accusation that outrages many Israelis who point to Israel's religiously and ethnically diverse society to disprove this claim. The reverberations and scars from the Second Intifada continue to be felt today, but with the near total separation of Gaza and the West Bank and the two separate Palestinian governing bodies in those areas, the experience of Palestinians in both of those areas is very different. Since 2005, Israel and Egypt, with the support of the US and the European Union, have enforced a strict blockade on Gaza, controlling all of Gaza's borders and access to the Mediterranean. Israel and Egypt argue that the blockade is meant to control the flow of weapons into Gaza, including the mortars and missiles used in the three wars fought with Israel. But it's also made life more difficult for Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Palestinian American historian Rashid Khalidi put it like this, Fuel, electricity, imports, exports, and the movement of people in and out of the Strip has been slowly choked off, leading to life-threatening problems of sanitation, health, water supply, and transportation. According to the World Bank, the blockade has resulted in the collapse of the economy in Gaza, with a near 50% unemployment rate that goes up to 70% among young people. According to Marina West, the World Bank's director for the region, a combination of war, isolation, and internal rivalries has left Gaza in a crippling economic state and exacerbated the human distress. Yet many Gazans also complain about corruption as they watch Hamas funnel international aid towards rockets and tunnels used for wars that only lead to more distress. Having three devastating wars in such a small area resulted in significant civilian casualties and Palestinian claims that Israel targets civilians. 
In response, Israel points to its strict military code of conduct meant to protect civilian life on both sides, as well as Hamas's use of civilians as human shields. But these arguments have not helped Gazans feel any better about the loss of life during these wars. In the West Bank, Palestinian daily life is significantly better than in Gaza, but anger, frustration, and distrust are still rampant. As a result of Oslo, the Palestinian Authority remains an autonomous governing body in the main Palestinian population centers of the West Bank. Problems in the West Bank include internal violence, economic problems, corruption, and lack of political reform, no elections held since 2006, water issues, and the Palestinian Authority struggling to pay its employees. And settlement construction continues to be a source of frustration among Palestinians. Polls show that most Palestinians reject any historic Jewish connection to the land of Israel, a perspective perpetuated in Palestinian textbooks and media. Now, this rejection deeply upsets Israelis and further complicates efforts to bring peace and understanding between the two sides. Many Palestinians and those sympathetic to their cause see settlements and the Israeli military presence as an unjust and illegal occupation of land they feel is rightfully theirs. Many Israelis and their supporters find the word occupation offensive and a rejection of the historic Jewish connection to the land. The question is, how do two sides who have difficulty accepting the claims of one another ever form a lasting peace? The fact remains that there are two people who both lay claim to that land and have lived there. For many, the seeds of peace are planted with empathy. That peace can only be attained when both sides can understand the other and feel the truth of the other's longing and suffering, whatever their opinion is about the claims those feelings are based on. Our hope with this series is to have played our small part in exploring the claims and feelings of both sides while encouraging you to go further, dig deeper, and keep exploring. Thanks for watching.